Morning, everyone. Um, so I am here this morning with Richard Morell from the British Library. He is going to present, in her own words, the postage stamps of Jennifer Toombs. Um, Richard will be taking questions at the end, so please do put your questions in the Q&A uh, section at the bottom. And over to Richard. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Good morning and thank you all for kind of being here so early on a Friday morning especially before your second cup of coffee. So as, as Isabel says, my name is Richard Scott Morell and I'm one of the curators for the British Library's Philatelic Collections. So the, the department was formed in 1891 via kind of Thomas K. Tapkin's bequest of his worldwide collection of postage stamps, telegraph stamps and postal stationery to the Department of Printed Books in the British Museum Library. Um, possessing no in-house curatorial expertise to manage the collection, the British Museum's Board of Directors appointed the preeminent philatelist Sir Edward Denny Bacon to arrange, write up, manage the collection. And then in June 1895, Jane Hamilton, who was employed as his assistant, becoming the, the kind of museum's first ever female curator. Uh, the Taplin Collection finally opened as a permanent exhibition in the King's Library on the 5th of October 1903 between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. And Taplin's collection remained displayed in such a manner, with a, aside from a, a small gap during the Second World War, right the way up until its eventual transfer to the British Library St Pancras site in 1997. Uh, the the, the um, Taplin's generosity coupled with kind of Bacon and Hamilton's outstanding work, firmly placed the museum on the global philatelic map. And yesterday, my colleague, Paul Skinner, uh, his informative presentation um, highlighted that we, we've actually been receiving kind of a, a very steady stream of donations, bequests, and official government transfers um, of, of their archives to, to the collection ever since. And we are in effect the nation's kind of philatelic collection with holdings currently standing at around 80 major archives comprising in excess of 8.5 million um, collection items, which cover almost every aspect of philatelic interest. Now, for Toomsiana specialists, the British Library's philatelic collections are the most significant research resource anywhere, and to enlighten the, the unenlightened or the uninitiated, the term refers to collectors and researchers who are interested in the stamps and other philatelic products designed by Jennifer Toome, shown here. Now, born in 1940, Jennifer was exposed to art and design from a young age. Her father worked for the Metal Box Company, kind of designing exhibition stands and displays. And as a four-year-old, she recalled watching her father kind of painting seascapes and being transfixed by the array of colours he used. And she developed a passion for art from that point onwards. She attended the Watford College of Art and graduated with a national diploma in design and soon afterwards was employed by the industrial de design firm Eric Marshall Associates to kind of design lettering for Potterton boilers and ultra radios. It was here that she encountered um, one of her employer's kind of clients, the security printing firm Thomas Derrillaru and Company Limited. Uh, and when that when 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 Delarue decided they were going to subcontract out some of their stamp design commissions due to the pressure of work, Jennifer seized the opportunity. Her first commission in 1963 was for the Lebanon 1964 Fourth Mediterranean Games issue. Now, as the stamp designing work kind of poured in for her, Jennifer went freelance, pursuing a career that spanned five decades. And during this time. She designed hundreds of stamps, cachets and first day covers for well over 70 countries, including Guernsey, Jersey, Bhutan, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, Saudi Arabia and over 33 different Commonwealth countries. Travelling the world and collaborating with other designers during the course of her work, Jennifer um, has actually become one of the most prolific international stamp designers of the second half of the 20th century and early millennium. millennium. As such, she was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in 1974 and was made a member of the Chartered Society of Designers in 1987. A committed Christian, genuine music lover, particularly classical music, and with a keen intellect and creative energy, she continued working 
um, right the way up to near her near to her untimely death on the 2nd of April 2018. Now, the British Library's philatelic collections contain three major archives of relevance to kind of Jennifer Toombs designs. The, the first and most significant and actually most recently acquired um, uh, was bequeathed to the collection by Jennifer Toombs herself. And this is the Jennifer Toombs archive. It comprises over 20 um, lever arch boxes full of files um, of her um, of her research notes, correspondence, artwork, and, and associated materials, uh, pre uh, predominantly for um, the period from the mid mid nineteen sixties up to about twenty fifteen. Um, there are gaps in this material. Uh, so, for example, it's predominantly Commonwealth material. So, there's no Jersey or Guernsey that I've seen in there, um, but a very rich resource with, with hundreds of files and material. Second. Uh, so the second most important archive is the, the Crown Agents Philatelic and Security Printing Archive. Now, this is a vast archive that we've had for quite a long time. Um, two particular areas of this collection that, that spring to me as important for Toomsiana specialists are the Crown Agent um, uh, artwork, which comprises uh, about 60,000 original pieces of artwork used in the production of, of various stamps. And we've got a good corpus of Jennifer Toombs's um, colour finish artwork in the collection and, and other materials. And then secondly, there's over 200 boxes of proof material covering um, well in excess of 100 countries. Uh, so that gives a really good coverage of, of various um, proofs and progressive proofs and so on. Now, as a to uh, the, the final collection um, that's worth mentioning immediately is the Universal Postal Union collection of specimen and, and, and sample kind of postage stamps. This comprises about 230 volumes of postage stamps worldwide covering the period from the second half of the 19th century up to about 1992. Uh, and in there you'll find um, good ex examples of almost all of her postage stamps uh, for that period in, in an un unused condition. So, Although there are gaps within these different collections, as a totality, uh, they, they kind of provide an almost complete overview of her work. So what kind of material would a Toomsie Arms a researcher kind of expect to encounter when, when they come to the library? So um, the, the Jennifer Toom archive in, includes a substantial corpus of commission letters from the Crown Agents Jersey, as well as other security printing firms, such as the selector shown here uh, from the Crown Agents to Jennifer Toombs, commissioning her to produce artwork for the St. Vincent 1980 Christmas stamp issue. Um, it also includes some of the original research materials used in the preparation stamp designs, such as this, this kind of Victorian postcard depicting a Dickensian character called Mrs. Um, Sari Gamp, and it was used by Toombs to develop designs for the Cayman Islands 1970 Charles Dickens issue. There's also a wealth of preliminary sketches, such as this one here um, for the Gibraltar 1975 fifth hundred anniversary of the birth of Michelangelo issue. And also there are some examples of colour rough artwork, such as this um, two cent stamp artwork entitled Pitcairn Bush, which was submitted for the Pitcairn 1969 to 75 definitive issue. Now the Crown Agents and um, the Crown Agents Philatelic and Security Printing Archive complements and fills many of the gaps within, within the Jennifer Toombs archive. It, like I said, it includes the 60,000 pieces of original artwork, such as this beautiful colour finished piece of artwork that, that would have been used by the printers to, to for the manufacture of the stamps. Uh, and, and this is a, a pit care, this is the colour finish for the Pitcairn 1969 definitive issue 40 cent stamp. And then again, out of the out of the thousands of, of proof material um, samples we've got in, in the archive, th this is one here for Jennifer Toombs's St. Vincent 1973 uh, Wilberforce issue 50 cent stamp. So the worldwide UPU collection of specimen stamps, uh, like I say, is, is a large collection and, and it, it ends in 1992, but we do have uh, examples, like I said, of the uh, Jennifer Toombs' stamps, such as this Pitcairn Islands 1968 Handicrafts issue 20 cent stamp. 
And then in addition to this, the department also houses a substantial collection of kind of journals, serials, periodicals, um, some of which will contain articles and material relating to Jennifer Toombs, such as this wonderful interview um, um, taken um, and published by uh, Gibbons Stamp Monthly in September 1968, where um, Jennifer Toombs talks about her visit to Pitcairn in, in preparation for the development of, of a definitive series and, and future stamp issues. Now, um, such materials used in conjunction with Jennifer's copious design reports um, in her personal archive, like this one for the unissued Jamaica 1968 Human Rights Year issue, enables us to uh, recreate her thoughts, ideas and working methods in a way which is almost unique compared to any other stamp designer. And, and being a huge fan of her work, I've set about trying to do this by starting to curate the material in a manner which would enable Jennifer to kind of narrate her own work for possibly even an upcoming book. And the following examples which we're, we're going to look at, um, I've encountered during the course of, of my research and, and they're of particular personal interest. And I feel what we're about to look at really do showcase our, our materials potential. So what we've got here from the Tombs archive are some of the uh, co original colour off um, watercolour paintings for the uh, uh, Tristan de Kuna 1969 United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Issue. I have in my hand here um, her written account describing the designs which were submitted with the artwork. So she writes, and I'm, I'm reading this, but uh, for, there are two sets, a set A and a set B, and she says general set A. Um, These four designs are straightforward representations of various scenes from the activity of the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel on Tristan de Cunha. These scenes are historic in sequence from the earliest times of missionary work to the present day. Each design would bleed off at the perforations to give maximum room for presentation. And in each case, the Queen's portrait would be in silhouette to focus on the scene. The lettering is in a classical base style, but in sans serif to give it simplicity. And then she goes on for the 1A stamp, which is the three pence on the top there. The first arrival of the missionary ship, a quiet sea at evening, with the sun breaking through a low bank of clouds, somewhat symbolically. Tristan, with its permanent ring of clouds, looms on the horizon, um, whilst wandering albatrosses wheel aft off the ship. I felt that a fitting subheading into this first of the four designs could be the command given by the risen Christ to his disciples, the first missionaries in Acts 1.8. Here he tells them to be his witness to the uttermost parts of the earth, and Tristan de Cunha is reputed to be the loneliest inhabited island in the world. She then gives an instruction that it require free printings to produce this artwork. So then uh, she goes for the next the next design, the 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 nine pence. Uh, this design is based on a contemporary engraving of the house of Governor J uh, Corporal Glass, in which the first services were held shortly after the arrival of Father William Tame in 1851. Here I've shown the exterior view of the house with its porches and thatches, roofs, and the folk making their way thither. Corporal Glass is shown in the foreground, conversing with Father Taylor, and the scene is lit from behind to give clarity. CF the next design for printings. And then we move on to the one shilling sixpence stamp, a complete contrast to the serenity of the previous scene. This depicts the epic landing of the remains of Father Jodgson's luggage in the early 1880s. Father Dodgson, brother of Charles Lewis Carroll Dodgson, landed with a minimum of luggage but left the cabin of the ship Edward Vitry to let a ride at anchor and wait for calmer weather before landing the rest of Dodgson's belongings. Then a terrific storm blew up and tore the schooner from her moorings and when she was driven aground where she broke up. Few items were salvaged from the wreck. Here I have shown the men battling against the wind and waves uh, to drag both longboats and baggage ashore, with the storm clouds ripping across the sky and the masts of the schooner in the distance showing the keeling over at a giddy angle before going down. Free printings. And then she has the two and sixpence. Now the story is brought up to date. 
with St Mary's Church as it stands today, complete with the new bell tower, I decided to bring in the USPG symbol and center it around the processional cross. This might also be a symbolic in another way, the procession around the church itself, symbolic of the strength and power of Christian worship and way of life of the people of Christian, served by the work of the USPG. The design is also intended to match the nine points design, the two services on Christian, one showing the earliest, the other depicting the modern. To this purpose, I presented three themes in similar fashion, both with the lighting from behind and both from a low viewpoint, uh, four printings, including gold. And then she has for her set B, these four designs, which I've got two of which are shown here, not four, uh, are in complete contrast to the first scenic representations. They are more of a graphic character. The object of this exercise is to bring together the history and work of the USPG and various day-to-day -day aspects from Christian life in symbolic form. And because of the circular symbol, I chose an object of a circular form for each of the second sim symbols, echoing the USPG symbol. On each design, the portrait of a figure of a USPG uh, missionary work is featured inside the, the symbol, whilst the Queen's portrait is now replaced by the Royal Cipher, free printings throughout, including gold for the cipher. Uh, I'm not going to describe all of her stamps here, I'm just going to describe the two that we've got on display. So we, we have here the, uh, ooh, good point, we have Reverend Taylor, um, which is the free pence stamp. It says, coupled with this portrait, the first chaplain to Tristan is part of the ship's steering wheel or tiller, typical of the 18th and 19th century ships. Incidentally, the symbolic shape would be a half tone of the background color, same as for the main feeding. The brown could be suggestive of the old timber ships. And then we have following that, we have the Dodgson, the, the uh, nine, nine pence stamp. One unique feature of Tristan life is the fishing industry, here symbolized by the unique gadget used in making fishing line. This was salvaged from a shipwreck. It is uh, somewhat coincidental that the support for the cogged wheel should be in the form of a cross. She does go on about the other two stamps in the set, but we don't have them here. So like I said, I'm going to move forward. So moving on to a, another issue. Um, these come from the tombs archive again, and this is some of the research material she used in the, along with the, the postcard we looked at earlier to design the um, Cayman Islands 1970 Charles Dickens issue. And you might be looking at these thinking of what they got to do with stamps and, and you'll, you'll find out during the following discussion. So in addition to this material, um, we know from Jennifer's own notes that in developing the stamp design, she, she went to Dickens and read the original source material herself. Um, and what I have here is um, a, a reading of, of the annotation she made from the book. So we'll go on now. So for the one cent stamp here, um, she quotes the following from, from Dickens regarding the character Barnaby Rudge. Um, he was about three and, 20, uh, three and 20 years old and though rather spare of a fair height and strong make, his hair of which he had a great profusion was red and hanging in disorder about his face and shoulders. His dress was green, clumsily trimmed here and there, apparently by his own hands with gaudy lace. A pair of tawdry ruffles dangled at his wrist while his throat was nearly bare. He was ornamented, his hat with a cluster of peacock's feathers, but they were limp and broken and now trailed negligently down his back. Girt to his side was a steel hilt of an old sword and blade without, without blade or, or scabbard, and some party-coloured ends of ribbons and poor glass toys completed the ornamental portion of his attire. The fluttering and confused disposition of all the motley scraps that formed his dress bespoke the disorder of his mind and by a grotesque contrast set off the heightened more impressive wildness of his face um, then moving on for the 12 cent stamp uh, we have her description for mrs gamp sari gamp who we saw in the postcard earlier miss gamp had a large bundle with her a pair of patterns and a species of big umbrella the latter article in color like a faded leaf she was a fat old woman this miss gamp with a husky voice and a moist eye which she had a remarkable power of turning up and once showing the white of it. Having very little neck, it cost her some trouble to look over herself, if one may say so, at those to whom she talked. She wore a very rusty black gown, rather the worse for snuff, and a shawl and bonnet to correspond. 
The face of Miss Gamp, the nose in particular, was somewhat red and swollen, and it was difficult to enjoy her society without becoming conscious of the smell of spirits. Uh, moving on then to the 20 cent, she, she read uh, the following description and note, made these notes about David Copperfield and Mr. Micawber. Mr. Micawber, a stoutish middle-aged person in a brown surtout and black tights and shoes with no more hair upon his head, which was a very large one and very shining. Then there is upon an egg and a very extensive face which he turned full upon me. His clothes were shabby, he, but he had an imposing shirt and collar on. He carried a jaunty sort of stick and with a large pair of rusty tassels to it and a quizzing glass hung over his coat. For ornament, I afterwards found as he very seldom looked through it and couldn't see anything when he did. Turning to David, she writes, behold me in a much worn little white hat with a black cape around it for my mother. Uh, uh, yeah, for my mother, a black jacket and a pair of hard stuff corduroy trousers. And then finally, she, she makes the following notes regarding the, the marchioness. She had no bonnet, no, nothing on her head, but a great cap, which in some time had been worn by Sally Brass, whose taste in headdresses, as we have seen, is peculiar. Her shoes, which being extremely large and slipshod, flew off every now and then. So you can note how the colours of the stamps are tying in with some of these um, features uh, for the design. Now, what we're actually looking at on this slide are the colour finishes that are in the Crown Agents uh, Philatelic and Security Printing Archive used to, um, used to manufacture the stamps. And we've already read some of her notes from Dickens's works and we've seen some of the postcards and images. So now let's see what she's got to say about the actual stamp designs herself. So she says, she submitted two sets, we've only got one set here. Um, so for set A, she says, this is a portrayal of typical Dickens characters rather than actual scenes. And to enhance the Victorian theme, I've shown each character in an inn sign, perhaps evocative of the days of old coaching inns. The source of influence for these designs was an old wrought iron hotel sign in Tembe, which we saw on the previous slide. Since the focal point would be centered around the figure, I've indicated a glow behind with the surrounding areas in a darker tone to avoid bittiness in the design. All the lettering is the Victoriana Windsor elongated, and there are free printings throughout. So for the free Three pence Mar S. by this point, the, the, the values were changed. She says, a symbol of poverty and slavery in mid-Victorian times, this poor little downtrodden maid of all work is shown against a cold blue background. So we're actually looking at the 40 cent here. Okay, the, the denominations were changed. Um, Dickens had described a unique character to one who would otherwise be devoid of character. And the small servant uh, becomes one of the most appealing of all Dickens people complete with a huge mop hat, tatty frock, sloppy slippers and a bucket. And then for what, what is the, the 12 cent stamp that she, she submitted as a six pence denomination, she writes a Sari Gamp, a complete contrast to the 3D design. This huge lovable old villain has been rightly described as the greatest of all Dickens's great creations. The ruddy red background has been suggested to blend in with Sari Gamp's love of the bottle and her full-blooded character generally. Here she waddles across the inside wearing shawl and patterns and carrying the inevitable bag bottle and rolly. Move, she... For the for the Barnaby um, Rudge stamp that that was eventually you know here it's of the one cent on the screen she submitted it as a nine pence uh, denomination she writes another of Dickens most fascinating of characters and one that I feel would make an ideal subject for the silhouette type of portrayal as in these designs uh, the greenage background is suggestive of his rustic nature as well as from the sir to coat he wears and floating from his person a ribbon, string, the old broken sword, peacock's feathers and a basket on which he is perched grip, his pet raven, a half screwy but completely adorable character. And then finally for the Mr. Micawber and David Copperfield artwork she says, Mr. Micawber with his unmistakable stance and David waiting for something to turn up. The brown background could be suggestive of Mr. Micawber's coat as well as his warm hearted nature. So you can begin to see how, how much thought and work goes into the designs. 
using um, now some of the um, issued stamps from the UPU collection um, for the uh, Western Samoa 1971 um, Myths and Legends issue. I'm, I'm going to talk about what she writes about the, these beautiful stamps. She says of them, this is a straightforward representation of four chosen wood carvings on pillars, but with the addition of special lighting effect to accentuate the carvings and to provide a somewhat drastic effect altogether. Because of the similarity in colouring of the wood, any colour changes in the background, which is in each case dark to emphasise the subject shown. And I have so selected the colours as to make a good combination as a set in order of value. The lettering, uh, it is a lighter tone of the background colour and chunky, suggestive of blocky carvings. There is no white guttering. The colour would bleed off at the edges, the reason being to allow maximum area of space for the lettering and to show the carvings to best advantage. Um, so for the free Senate stamp, showing the legend of Salamacina. I'm very sorry if I mispronounced the, the, um, the, the names. Of, um, little to comment on this one. The source of lighting is from the top right hand, highlighting the two top figures and leaving the ones huddled together below in shade to be printed in four colours. For the eight cent stamp she, uh, showing Lou and his sacred hens, a rich dark bronze green would I feel be nice for this design, especially with the magnificent wood grain colours as a prominent feature. I have um, shown the lighting as almost radiating from the God Tagaloa down to, onto Lou, who climbs up what appear to be mountains, or are they clouds? Four colours. The Tenseni for Samoa's origin, the God Tagaloa. This design presented a slight problem in that the proportion of the pillar is much squatter than the others. In order to retain some sort of consistency throughout, I've used a little artist license in slightly reducing the girth of the pillar fading off at the right hand side into the background colour. This focuses full attention onto the panel shown Tagaloa. The background colour chosen is a deep blue sea, sea blue. Tagaloa fished up the island out of the Pacific, five colours. And then finally, the 22 cent shown Mount Veo and the Pool of Tears. Again, a straightforward presentation with the source of light coming from the upper right corner, frying the pattern and textures of the trees and foliage into sharp relief and in shadow below. The poor little maid weeping into the pool for colours. Um, again, from this collection, um, in addition to the actual design reports, the, the Jennifer Toombs archive also houses kind of essays and articles reminiscing on the designs that she'd done in the past, where she's looking backwards rather than a more contemporary description. And um, we, we have uh, one such essay um, which relates to her work on designing the Jura stamps for Antigua and Cayman Islands. So um, what we've got here is an example of one of these. This is the Antigua 1971 e Easter issue. And she writes, my first encounter with the works of Jura for use on stamps happened 11 years ago when I was commissioned to design a set of Easter stamps for Antigua for release in 1971. Three of the engravings were needed, one from the Small Passion, another from the Eichstatt Missile, and it was up to me to decide how to display these to advantage in view of the small format. One of the challenges of designing a stamp is the know-how of display and presentation. A stamp design is not necessarily a pretty picture by any means. Often the designer has to show the subject in a way akin to a window display or exhibition presentation, or even as a picture frame, for the subject itself is the most important thing and should be shown off to maximum advantage. This was certainly so in the case for the Antigua exercise. In fact, this type of design is described as framework, but what sort of frame to use? Bearing in mind the nature of the topic, late Renaissance, highly intricate work in fine line, I would obviously settle for something very simple. So many designs are ruined by use of wrong color or over fussy borders. And in brackets, she qualifies this. And I, I have um, been guilty of this before now too. And then she closes the brackets and continues. And the subject matter has becomes lost. So if the frames are too complex, you lose the design in, in essence. Eventually, I decided not to use a frame at all, but instead depict the engraving on a plain background, which would give an indented appearance with a camphored time. time. On the edge would be shown the name of the country, the value, and, and, uh, and being then a dependent territory, the Royal Cipher. 
However, I made the mistake of not including the words Easter 1971, and strangely, this was overlooked by most people concerned. Uh, the style of lettering was my own design based on the superb Dura monogram. I was also commissioned to design the first day cover for this issue, and for this I had a trump card up my sleeve. Earlier I had, the un had had the unforgettable experience of visiting the uh, Oburamagal Passion Play in 1970. Uh, like everyone else, I came away deeply moved. Among the other sites in this lovely town was the church where a special exhibition was mounted in conjunction with the play. Among the many leaflets on show was a folder of prayers where we, um, the front page of which was illustrated with a very moving engraving of Christ, the man of sorrows, enveloped with grief. This was from the title page of The Small Passion of Dura and was the most obvious choice for my cover design. The next time I encountered it, well, we, we'll leave this part here because it then goes on to the Cayman Islands, which we, we don't have. But you can begin to see how she's always thinking about her work, always critically engaging with it to try and improve it. Where I will end on this part, though, I will say this is her conclusion to the essay. Both exercises were, for me, a most joyful and interesting challenge to portray the genius of this great artist in a way which would reach people who might otherwise never see these works, not even in books. I felt really honoured to be asked to do these designs, and I hope it will not be long before I have another encounter with the works of Dura on stamp design. Returning back to the, I'm combining the, the Jennifer Toombs archive, some of the library's wider book collection and the Crown Agents artwork here to, to talk about the origin and development of, of Jennifer's British Honduras 1972 main artifacts issue. It's quite a complex story that was published last year in the LP and I'd refer people who are interested to that article. But um, what we have here is a postcard from the Toombs archive uh, a book from the library's uh, wider collections for a, an exhibition held in the Met called 50, uh, Masterpieces of 50 Centuries, and some of Jennifer Toombs' notes that she made at that exhibition. And like I said, this is research material for the stamp issue, which we'll discuss through looking at her um, colour, uh, the, the colour rough images that are in the uh, Crown Agents Philatelic and Security Printing Archive. So she says about the general aspects of the design, the, ma the major influence of this set of stamps, all depicting artefacts of the same material, jade, has been the special methods of display adopted by museums for small articles such as these. One particular museum I have in mind is the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which put on a special exhibition, 50 Centuries of Masterpieces, earlier this year, in which certain items, including artefacts and jewellery, as well as ceramics, paintings and sculpture, were brilliantly displayed by means of spotlighting and the use of colour. The lighting especially was a masterpiece in itself, as it was used to highlight not only each item, but certain aspects of characteristics to the fullest advantage. It was with this special display lighting in mind that I chose to thus de depict the jades, all a bas relief, which call for lighting not from the front, which would kill the effects, but from angles to the side of each of them. This uh, throws up the carving into full relief and imparts a three dimensional quality, which is the essence of these artifacts. The source of the lighting in, in each case is governed by the subject matter or portrait. Since the artefacts are of a constant colour, with slight subtle change, I've chosen to show backgrounds of different colours, yet which would be complementary to each image. Again, I noticed how well the Metropolitan Museum had achieved this balance of colour, both on the blocks on which the items were displayed and in the walls of each room. The lettering too is to be complementary and in keeping with the style of the period. Strangely enough, I found an Art Nouveau type face the most suitable with slight curves to each letter the rounded corners and chunkiness that is typical of the carvings themselves. A modified version of the same face has been adopted for the territorial name at the foot of the vertical design. This is interesting um, because we're not just seeing her merely reproducing images that are supplied to her as part of the, the commission. She's actually um, been influenced by a lot of things that are much less measurable. In this instance, quite literally, the lighting in a public exhibition. So curators watching, be aware that your work does potentially have impact. So moving on now to the to the uh, three cent pendant. 
the source of lighting is above the image, producing a parabolic reflection and highlighting the face of the seated figure. The slope in top of the carved um, carving leads to the wall cipher, but the eye is prevented from strain out of the design by means of the dark shadow down the right hand side of the picture. In this case, as in all others, the territorial name is, is reversed out of the black in full strength red, whilst the subheading is in half tone. The value is white out in every case, four printings, including the metallic gold for the cipher. She then says of the six cent pendant, this time the lighting comes from the lower right hand, so the dancing priest is facing it. Uh, it could also impart a rather eerie and magical feeling. No doubt the dance was some form of ritual in Mayan ceremonies, and again, four colours. Um, so that then for the for the sun god's god's head, in this, the only horizontal design I have explicated a theme which probably featured more uh, frequently in ancient American life, the worship of the sun. Much of the art of Central American, um, especially Aztec and Inca art, is of this theme. And from small items of jewellery to the great pyramids of Chichen Itza and Tenochtitlan, the sites of worship are, uh, and often terrible sacrifices of human victims to the sun god, identified by the Aztecs as text. Catlipoca. Uh, this artifact supposedly is the largest jade in existence, is shown in front of a background suggestive of fire, heat and light of the sun, and the fierce and savage features uh, could well have reflected this awe and terror of the rituals, although the Mayas were considerably less bloodthirsty than the Aztecs. Nonetheless, some human sacrifice was practiced among the tribes. The sloping fires behind the, the uh, head are vaguely rem reminiscent of the solar prominences or, or eve part of the corona, each part of the corona seen during a total eclipse. Uh, however, the head is seen resting firmly on the ground as depicted by the black shadow, five colors. She then moves on to the 26 cent large jade plaque. In this design, I've chosen an inharmonic color, a rich olive green to complement the jade green of the artifact. An oblique light is cast across the carving uh, with the seated figures facing the source of light in to be printed in four colors. And finally, the 50 cent pendant. The final design is in violet, in contrast well with the olive green uh, of the previous design. Here, the spotlight is more circular with the light coming from the left, four colors. Um, for the, uh, for her, the, she's got a very interesting file for the Turks and Caicos Islands 1973 Lucane remains issue. And I like this, this particular file because it has original photographs of the pre-Columbian artifacts of, of the, of the in, um, indigenous population. Uh, and in addition to the um, kind of rough preliminary sketches we have some examples of how she's experimenting to develop textures in her stamp design as shown here with this um with this kind of textile web web textile which we'll we'll discuss um interestingly uh the the these artifacts uh, were all stolen from the museum in turk and caicos several years after the stamps and have only recently some only only in the last year or two have, have some of them been kind of um repatriated so it's a really interesting story and actually these for a while were were Im the stamp designs depicted images of lost pre-columbian artwork so very interesting uh looking at the stamp designs you can see the background for the textiles you you can understand how she's experimenting and, and shows how much how our techniques work, which I find fascinating. Um, so what does she have to say about her designs? Well, let's have a look. So she says, this is a five stamp, this is a five stamp set in an issue, presumably to be printed in a single strip, just like the UK Battle of Hastings issue of 1966. Therefore, I've aimed at showing a continuity in design by means of most important color common to all designs, i.e. black, around the perforations. I've deliberately run this color to the edges as I feel it would add to the continuity and also facilitate printings. In a settlement issue as this, the black would also show up each subject better as well as the individual background colors pertinent to each value. The background of each design is a result of an experiment. It gives the suggestion of webbing or net fabric by means of special Japanese paper on which is sprayed the color. 
I feel a textured background like this might help add to the general interest and show up the shape of the exhibits better without becoming an entity in itself. The letter in his contour designs a slightly offbeat sans serif, which I feel suitable to the subject. A dummy value tablet, five senses indicated on each design. Now regarding the subjects themselves, I decided to display them in a symmetrical order of the six items featured. I show five, five two duhos or stools, two wooden bowls and one axe. Uh, the latter would be the central feature with the two bowls adjoining and the two stools either end. This would balance up the overall effect. The items listed below are shown in the order in which I'd prefer them to be shown. I've not actually done them this way, but, but you know, we, we could have a look. So for, for the do host stool, the complete one, five cent, she writes, I've chosen this one in preference to the other full length stool since this shows special pattern in at the top end of the tail uh, piece and the overall shape is rather graceful. Because of the height of the tail, I've moved the subhead in over slightly to the right four colours, including the metallic gold for the Meijin portrait. She then does the broken wooden bowl, more or less a straight copy from the photo supplied. However, I've emphasised the lighting effect in order to show up the shape better and the wood grain into four colours. Uh, for the Greenstone Act, she writes, the only subject shown which is of a different colour. I thought a violet coloured background would act as a foil to the colour of the act, which itself appears highly polished. The angle of the act leads to the eye the eye from the uh, subcaption down to the value tablet, four colours. And then she has the wood bowl complete. Unlike the other bowl above as seen from the edge on, this one is shown in a three quarter view and a slight angle. The lovely wood grain um, is shown here, again by attempting a satisfactory light in effect, four colours. And then finally, fragments of the duho. What, what looks like a bit like Godzilla, I think it's lovely. Um, uh, the reason for this choice is the rather interesting shape of the leg, what a shame the stool was broken. Both this and the head are shown in prominence with just a hint of grain in four colours. Um, then um, for for the we've got we've got her colour uh, preliminary sketches uh, for the uh, stamps of the Gibraltar fifth hundred and birth anniversary of Michelangelo, coupled with the sketches and mock-ups for the for the for the stamp booklet. She writes the, the following, she goes, the three items of sculpture by Michelangelo selected for this issue are the Bruges Madonna in the Royal Academy of Arts and the Pieta in the Vatican. Um, one showing our Lord after his crucifixion, the other two depicting him as, as an infant. At first glance, perhaps two themes somewhat unrelated, one might think. The joy of the infant and his mother compared with the serene grief of the Pieta, the epitome of tragedy and calm resignation. Yet on closer observation and contemplation, one begins to realise that these three works are very closely related indeed. There is no element of foreboding in the two Madonnas, which foretells the passion and death of Christ, the Pietro course complete in the story. In the Bruges Madonna, uh, we, we, we see no meek and mild virgin, but one stern of aspect sitting bolt upright. And I quote from the world of Michelangelo, life books by Michael Coulon, she knows what is going to happen to her son. Very dramatic stuff. The theme of foreboding is taken a stage further by the Tade plaque, the Holy Child is seen rushing away from the figure of St. John the Baptist, who holds out a goldfinch, leads up to the wonderful Pietro on the third stamp. Um, or the third, sorry, I got distracted by an email. Forgive me. Um, uh, Pietro on the third stamp, perhaps the finest and most visionary of all Pietas. Although essentially a portrayal of tragedy and grief, the face of the Virgin is utterly serene without a trace of despair, only acceptance. So it is with this theme in mind that I chose the colours for the stamps that would relate to this. The breakdown of the three designs is as followed, general aspects. Each stamp has a basic black background bleeding off at the perforations. This would highlight the sculptures and by play of lighting, similar to used on TV documentary programmes. The three dimensional quality of these would become more prominent. Again, that, that, that outside influence that's shaping how she works with light. Uh, for the 10 pence Bruges Madonna, I've deliberately cut off, rather put into shadow, the lower section of the statue. Uh, again, suggesting the foreboding of events to come. The light behind the statue is electric blue. Many schools of thought hold blue as the color of purity and honesty. Perhaps uh, the reason the Virgin is nearly always depicted in a blue robe. 
for the 16 pence Taddy Madonna. The lighting as on the photo loaned me is from a rather unusual angle, giving an almost ominous feeling. The yellow orange could suggest action and movement compared with the stillness of the preceding design and would tie up with that in the next design. For the 20 pence Pieta, I feel the best choice of color here is violet, symbolic both of mourning and of spiritual power. I've chosen a style of lettering which I feel is synonymous with the Renaissance and of course the forerunner period in which this style of lettering first evolved, the Roman. All the subheadings are a Renaissance italic and I suggested gold for the territorial name and royal cipher, although these could be shown in the same color as the background light if gold isn't feasible. The souvenir sheet, which we've got the title page to here, uh, takes the passion theme further. I've chosen one of Michelangelo's drawings, um, sorry, the souvenir sheet. Um, uh, Michelangelo's drawings, a study of the Colonna crucifixion, the drawing of which is in the Louvre, showing the figure of the Virgin beneath the cross. It's rather interesting to compare the somewhat agonized expression on her face with the serene countenance of the Virgin in the, um, in the Pieta. I've deliberately soft pedaled the presentation of the sheet by showing the background as a simulation of grey ingress paper or whatever type of paper would have been used by the artist. The stamps would show up better in the grey. Then she turns to the booklet, literally taking it page by page. So the cover, which is shown here, quite a formidable choice of subjects was open from items of architecture, paintings, drawings, and so on. But I eventually settled for a bust of the artist himself by one of his pupils. Paul's Daniel de Volterra. Uh, this would give instant recognition to the subject. The lettering, the Trajan face as described above, is featured here and in the heading throughout with an ornamental M. And I have spelt Buonarati as it was spelt at the time, such as on some of Michelangelo's, Michelangelo's architectural plans. Uh, the de Volterra head is in the Museo Nazionale del Bargello in Florence. I've also used a rich crimson red fade into a darker shade to effect a counter change on the portrait. Inside cover would include the postal rates of before, pages three and four, uh, text on the life history of Michelangelo, also on pages seven and eight. The copy I've suggested be set in a suitable printer's italic, preferably Arighi, and the first letter of each paragraph be in the rather fine ornamented script. Letra sets magnificent. Um, if preferred, the M of Michelangelo on the cover could be altered to this too. The main heading in the Trajan Roman lettering is the same color as on the cover. Pages five and six of the suit uh, have the souvenir sheet, which we've already discussed. And then finally, pages seven and eight are devoted to more copy of Michelangelo. And I've suggested showing examples of work apart from sculpture and drawing, a detail from the Sistine Chapel frescoes, showing the creation of the sun and moon, for example, an overleaf, a photo, maybe the inside of the dome of St. Peter's Rome. The back cover shows a photograph of a scene in Gibraltar. So starting to wind up now, because I've gone on quite a bit, um, what we have here is um, showing the, what the, some of the impact of her work. So we know that when, when, Toombs, when Jennifer Toombs visited Pitcairn, she bought a range of, of materials there to bring back to the UK, some of which were used to develop the Pitcairn Island's 1968 handicraft issue. Uh, and what, what, what shows, what, what I love about this, when you look at the philatelic magazines, um, you can see that there's always good reviews of her work and it actually inspires new work. So below that, what I have is a cartoon made by the Australian cartoonist um, Montague um, Archibald Thomas Wedd, um, who, who designed many comics and, and strips and small pieces for Stamp News Australia in the 50s, very popular set. And we have here one of his educational pieces talking about rare Myro wood from Pitcairn that was inspired by Jennifer Toombs' design. So literally her artwork inspired other artwork uh, and so on. Um, I think all that's left now to, to say is, you know, how do you come in and use the collection? So the, the, we have um, permanent display. Uh, we have a thousand frame permanent display area on the upper ground floor of the St Pancras building where we have a good, uh, about 60 to 80,000 collection items on permanent display, which you could come in and look at during the live reopening times. But people who wanna actually come in and do research, um, any, any member of the public can do so. You just need to get a reader's pass and, and book an appointment with us. We're open uh, Monday to Fridays from around 10.30 to four o'clock in the afternoon. 
Um, it's a higher security region, so although it is there for everyone, um, it is on a first come first serve basis. Uh, and I would urge, um, I would urge you, if you are interested in using our collections, to email um, quite in advance to avoid disappointment. So thank you very much for bearing with me, and I'll put you hand you over to Isabel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. That was a mate, a really, really brilliant. I really enjoyed listening to that. That was excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending as well. If you want to ask Richard any questions, don't forget to put them in the little Q&A at the bottom where you can pop them in chat and I will see them. Um, just whilst we are here, um, I just wanted to let you know there's lots of elf going on in Stampex. So pop back into the show, um, check out the round tables. We've got another talk coming up, I think at 11. Um, so, and also do go and check out the um, booth holders, lots of PTS member dealers there. Um, and if you are interested in attending a, a Stampex uh, in person, we've got a show at the Business Design Centre in um, London in, later in the year. So please do, um, please do, yeah, check out the website, stampexinternational.com. Um, if no one's got any questions for Richard, we can just giving up on a few seconds more to see if anyone's got any. <laughs> oh, um, here we go. So James, the digital philatelist. Hi. Um, he just basically makes a comment. Interesting that the 1971 Easter issue used Drewer and Gordon Drummond used the same for, Mal for Malawi. I believe if memory serves, um, I can't, there is an anniversary date tied in for that year. And I think that's some kind of anniversary date. And I think that's why Dura is quite a popular theme on stamps internationally around that time. Um, but of course, both were working for the Crown agent. So could there be a degree of kind of um, continuity in stamp issuing policy there? Needs more work. Why don't you come and have a look? You're more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, James, for the question. Um, brilliant. Well, thank you so much once again, Richard. That was absolutely brilliant. Really, really great. And if you um, want to, uh, everyone who's watching, tell your friends and re-watch it. The, this talk will be live in the auditorium in about an hour, so you can come back and watch it then. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Cheers. Have a, good yeah, have a lovely weekend. Bye. <laughs>